This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Tonight's episode, Crossover with Death. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. Dot com. While the movie industry tries to figure out how to operate in this new world, they will most likely fall back to their pre-pandemic positions, which include the already-owned intellectual property cinematic universe, AOI, PCU. Efforts outside of the comic book industry have really not done well. I'm looking at you, classic monster dark universe, but that's no reason not to try again. There's been a lot of reboots of TV series, Mission Impossible, Charlie's Angels, but no real work has been done to form a shared cinematic universe of TV show IP. So we're going to do it for them. You're welcome. The rules, IP that has already been used in a major film is out, and we will only include shows where the unifying element was a major part of it. The executive producer, the star, the creator, etc. Now our first attempt involves a name that anyone who watched TV in the 60s and 70s knows very well, Quinn Martin. His father was a film editor, and that's where he started in the industry. He moved on to other post-production work and eventually was an executive producer for Desi Lu. His first wife, Madeline Pugh Davis, was one of the main writers for I Love Lucy. In 1959, Desi Lu gave Martin a shot at producing a two-part special, which was part of the Westinghouse Desi Lu Playhouse anthology series, which later became The Untouchables. Now, per our own rules, we can't use that. Yeah. A year later, Martin started his own production company, QM Productions. From this point forward, he would have at least one primetime TV series running until 1980. You can instantly recognize most of his shows, as the credits include... A Quinn Martin production. And then a list of stars, with special guest stars... Janice Rule, Darlene Carr, Victoria Shaw, special guest star... William Shatner. And tonight's episode, Something Something of Death. Tonight's episode, The Salinas Jackpot. The New Breed ran for a season in 1961-62, a police drama with a team handling the toughest L.A. crimes. Leslie Nielsen starred. The Fugitive ran for four seasons from 63 to 67, the classic man on the run for a murder he did not commit concept with David Jansen. Now obviously, that's already been mined as IP. Yeah. 12 O'Clock High ran for three seasons from 1964 to 67, a World War II Army Air Corps epic starring Frank Overton, Paul Burke, and Robert Lansing. It might be difficult to include this in a shared universe without adding a time travel angle. Or maybe you could set it in the Middle East. The FBI ran for nine seasons from 65 to 74 with Ephraim Zimbalis Jr. as the star. This has been rebooted, but only for TV, so I think it can still be included. The Invaders ran for two seasons, 67 and 68, a sci-fi conspiracy theory series and basically a proto-X-Files, Roy Finn stars. This could be the source of that time travel angle. Dan August ran for a season from 70 to 71. Burt Reynolds, right before he became a movie star, plays a detective in his hometown. Cannon ran for five seasons from 71 to 76 and was partially responsible for the detective with a specific physical property genre. In this case, the overweight detective. William Conrad starred. The Streets of San Francisco ran for five seasons from 72 to 77. A veteran cop, Carl Malden, partners with a rookie inspector, Michael Douglas. Barnaby Jones ran for eight seasons from 73 to 80. Buddy Ebsen plays an elderly detective. The Manhunter ran for a season, 74-75, and starred Ken Howard as a bounty hunter. Most Wanted ran less than a season. This was the point where Quinn Martin began to lose steam. Robert Stack, a uh, callback to the Untouchables, runs an L.A. police unit set up to catch the, well, Most Wanted. Well, we could skip this one. Tales of the Unexpected ran for only eight episodes, a suspense anthology series with William Conrad as the narrator, and I think we can eliminate this one as well. All right, so that gives us the following possible characters or concepts to work with. The New Breed, Mob Crime Fighters. The World War II U.S. Army Air Corps, 12 o'clock high. The FBI. A sci-fi conspiracy, The Invaders. A hometown police detective, Dan August. An overweight P.I., Cannon. 
an old and a young police detective team, Streets of San Francisco. An old P.I., Barnaby Jones. And a bounty hunter, Manhunter. So the cops are easy enough to align, as are the P.I.s along with the bounty hunter. In fact, Cannon and Barnaby Jones actually had a TV crossover. This leaves 12 o'clock high and the invaders remaining. So now, we present our pitches for... The Quinn Martin Cinematic Universe, the QMCU. Okay, so mine starts with a hometown police detective, Dan August. He's gruff. Small-town police chief takes in an apparent orphan after a drug overdose kills her father. So, picture a Midwest city, Midwest crime, mostly at this point, the opioid epidemic. A drifter leaves behind a small child after overdosing. The chief must take her in and try to find any family for her. They bond, and he finds his softer side, but is unable to find her family. The overweight P.I. has a cameo as part of the search for her family. They find the family at the end. The girl drives away with them, looking longingly back at the police chief, who has also become a better person for knowing the girl. Post-credit sequence, the girl and her family are aliens. Wow. <laughs> okay, so then we cut to the FBI. We have short elevator pitch, disgraced agents uncover an alien plot to overtake the Senate and destroy the U.S. military. So this is kind of the base of my cinematic mm -hmm. universe. Okay, Four FBI agents in Washington, D.C., trying to stay under the radar as they investigate higher-ups in the federal government. We start with a recent Quantico grad who runs up against a senator who is doing something to add and gets assigned to an office that is basically purgatory for Washington agents. Three other agents assigned there who really were just resigned to their fates were inspired by the newbie and uncover a plot by the senator to rig an army contract that would have resulted in a terrible bloodbath of U.S. troops. Mm. Which leads us to the 12 o'clock high, which I am resetting into um, the Middle East somewhere. So, a kidnapped U.S. Army officer is about to reveal alien secrets. He's abducted and must be rescued. Um, we see the eager young FBI agent from the earlier movie. Probably has a younger sibling on the base in the Middle East. The younger sibling is about to um, tell the FBI agent something when they're abducted. The, 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 the army guy. Right. So the FBI agent teams up with the other siblings, with the other people from the siblings unit to find and rescue them from, surprise, the senator from the earlier movie who absconded at the end of the last movie and was all set to doomsday the U.S. troop. But the sibling had uncovered the plot and was going to re all to the FBI agent. Once again, the senator is foiled, but this time he's killed. post credit scene shows the autopsy of the senator and reveals some startling information. He's not human! Which leads us to the big tent pole, which is the invaders. The final installment, everything comes to a head in a big battle to save the Earth's population from alien invaders who have been seeding the opioid epidemic to change the human population. Somehow it does something to their DNA. The ultimate resolution depends upon the little girl, the small town sheriff, the gung-ho FBI agent, all getting together to defeat the invasion force. And then we go into a second phase where we have the new breed mob crime fighter, because the, the DNA changed um, in some of the people because of the drugs. Okay. So now we have a special investigation unit to clean up the mess created by the alien invasion. Um, and then we have a new breed of human. So new breed. Ooh, nice. Okay. And then um, an overweight PI and his two mobile assistants typically do missing persons cases, but when missing persons turns to murder... They wonder if they should keep looking. FBI agents from the FBI are involved somehow, and we can tie that in. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, same basic idea with the streets of San Francisco, only in this case we have one old school detective. The younger one has been affected by the DNA changes of the invasion, and they go after um, other bad guys that were infected by the invasion. Mm, so an, old, an alien nation yeah. type thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then finally the bounty hunter one. I just, I would love to see that as a comedy, the Ant-Man, so to speak, of the universe. Um, you don't know who Stephanie Plum is, but she's a comedic uh, bounty hunter type from book. Inexperienced, but needing a job. The only person willing to attempt to collect bounties on the aliens. Wow. So that's my cinematic universe. Pretty impressive. Well, here's my elevator pitch. <laughs> a secret branch of the FBI enlists cops and PIs to defend against alien invaders using their own time travel tech against them. In the first film of the franchise, P.I.'s Barnaby Jones and Cannon, along with Manhunter, team up to find the missing man. That man, David Vincent, who believes an alien invasion is underway. The P.I.'s turn over Vincent to the FBI for more questioning. 
In the second film, a team of cops from around the U.S., New Breed, Streets of San Francisco, Dan August, work together to stop a drug kingpin who is being funded by a mysterious organization. In the post credit sequence, we learn an FBI agent brought them together on this case and that he now wants them to join a larger group to fight an unnamed foe. In the third film, I, this united group of PIs, bounty hunters, and cops learn about the FBI's plan. David Vincent has shown them proof of an alien invasion and that they plan to use time travel tech to change Earth's path to make it an easier target. Vincent was able to reverse engineer the tech and now this group will go back to the past to stop the meddling. The group was picked because none of them were critical enough on their own to be noticed by the aliens. They go back to World War II and save the 12 o'clock high team. And future films can involve the team going to other eras to stop the aliens. It writes itself. It's basically uh, Legion, uh, you know, the um, Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, so, yeah. Except with the <laughs> Quinn Martin universe. Right, Sorry. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm sure we're going to see this in about five years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, you know, they're going to just take our, our uh, ideas here and completely right. rip us off. Yes. That's okay. We don't care. Anybody want to make those movies, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. If you want to make them, you can. But then you have to listen to our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes, on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching.